Hello everyone! In this tutorial I'm going to show you how to animate a jumping kick step by step using a reference. So let's begin. Open the sample scene containing any of the standard characters. I'm choosing the standard model male. The character appears in the viewport. In this video I won't be going into details of how to control the viewport camera or use manipulators. There are dedicated tutorials on that. However, let's quickly go over the hotkeys. Press Alt and left mouse button to rotate, Alt and mouse wheel to pan, Alt and right mouse button to zoom. Also, press E to rotate and W to translate. Before we begin to animate, we'll need to find a reference. Any video sequence that shows a motion we need will do. In our case, we'll be using the video from the Motion Actor channel. There are lots of great video references on that channel, go check it out. I have already edited the video file which now contains only the fragment I need. Now let's import this fragment to Cascadeur. To do so, go to File Import. Or you can simply drag the file into the program window. A plane showing a video reference has appeared in the viewport. Now let's move this reference to a more convenient place. I'd recommend keeping the reference planes a bit to the side from the character to clearly see what's happening on the video. You can also make the plane bigger by using the scale manipulator. To scale the plane by all three axes at the same time, you'll need to select the orange square in the center of the manipulator. If you have accidentally deselected the plane containing the video, you can select it again in the outliner. Let's also move the reference onto a separate track so we could easily select or hide it in the future. Select the reference plane and click the Add Track button. Here's the track that now contains the video. If you hold Alt and double click this track, you'll select every object it contains. This way, you can select the reference plane. You can also click the eye icon to hide the objects in the track or the lock icon to lock the track from editing. Fold the tracks for now. And we are ready to start making poses. To do this, I'll be using the auto-posing tool. So let's pose the character to look similar to what we have on the reference. First of all, let's move the character's pelvis a bit lower. Doing so will make the pelvis point active and it will turn blue. Now we need to set up the feet. The feet are quite far apart. And here look, auto-posing will automatically place a foot on the heel, which is not something I need at the moment. So what I'm going to do is move the foot so it would stand on the ground. Then select all the points of the foot and move every point at the same time. These points have been activated as well. So now the foot won't stand on the heel because I manually control every point it has. Keep in mind that rotating the foot would influence the direction of the knee. If you need to rotate the knee, you probably should do this by rotating the foot. To move the character's feet even more apart, we'll need to further lower the pelvis. Use the same approach to work with the arms. Rotating hands will have influence on the elbows. Oftentimes, this influence is enough for the elbows to take the desired positions. When you need to deactivate some of the points, select them and press Shift Z. But keep in mind that doing so will set elbows back to their automatic positions. You can also rotate an arm across the shoulder. Just click the shoulder with the right mouse button. Sometimes this might cause the arm to bend a little, but in our case, this is not a problem. Also, in this pose, you might need to activate the direction controller. If you don't, the character would rotate too much following the arms. You can activate the neck controller and drag it to tilt the character's body. Now I'll rotate the character's head. Once again, I try to activate as few points as possible. Here it's enough to only move the direction controller for the head. Also, don't forget to check the pose from different camera angles. You can even set two viewports at once to view the pose both from the front and from the side. Press the spacebar to do so. Now our pose is almost done, so we can start adding smaller details. For starters, I don't really like how the knee is rotated, and this can't be fixed by rotating the foot. In this case, I can activate the knee point and move it a bit. Hold Ctrl to slow down the manipulator and move the points with better precision. When you work on the pose, it's rather convenient to follow a specific order. First, only activate the big controllers, then the points at the hands and the feet, and only activate the remaining smaller points last. This way, poses are more likely to turn out quicker and better. The first pose is done. 
Also, you can press S to quickly switch to the view mode to see how the pose would look without any controllers. Press it again to go back to the edit mode. So how do we choose the keyframes? First of all, the frames where the character's feet either get off the ground or get back on it. These frames would define intervals with fulcrum points or without them. This is especially important for auto physics. Here in the video, we see how the foot leaves the ground. Here is the last frame where it still touches the ground. So it's a good place to set a key. Select the frame and add a new keyframe by clicking this button or pressing F. In this frame, the foot stands on its toes. Select every point of the foot and move the pivot to the toes. Now we can rotate the foot around the toes. Look at the knee. Its point is activated and because of that, it tries to keep its position, leading to this weird bending, which means it's better to only activate such points last. So deactivate this point by pressing Shift Z. Next, we select every controller in the character's body. Keep in mind that the box selection only selects active points. We need to move the body forward and up. The left leg should bend a little, but the right leg is not completely straight either. The active point at the shoulder is also not needed anymore. Now I'll deactivate the rotation controller. Currently the character rotates along with the arms, and I'm more likely to get a better result if I let auto-posing calculate body rotation automatically. Make sure you keep track of the character's line of sight. The attacking characters usually tend to look right in front of them. I think the pose is all but complete, so we can fix the shoulder now. The way it bends doesn't look natural. I'm adding the final touches while holding the control key. When you work on the pose, it can be useful to switch between the poses in the previous and in the next keyframe. And to quickly do so, hold Shift and press A or D. Watch the reference carefully and observe how and where various body parts move. The foot here makes contact with the ground again, so that's a keyframe. Deactivate the small point and the foot should be automatically placed on the ground. And now let's rotate it. The pose should look better if the other arm and leg are in the view. So I'll move the foot a bit farther away, so the other one is visible when we look at the character from the side. I'm rotating the arm along with the shoulder around the point of the neck. This immediately rotates the character's body as well. Control the way the spine bends by moving the neck controller. Also, in poses like this, it's important to pay attention to the way the knees bend. Try to avoid right angles. Right angles make the pose look less dynamic. This is the last frame before the jump, where the character's feet still on the ground. This means that we'll need a new keyframe. We can fix the toes by pressing R. Fixed points won't move, meaning other points won't affect them anymore. In this frame, the knees and the spine are straightened up. For now though, it would be better to leave the knees slightly bent, because later, completely straight limbs might not work well with interpolation. Of course, animation with half-bent legs might come off as somewhat crude, but for the current stage, this solution is good enough. We can always fix that later when we polish the animation. Now let's look at the pose in the view mode and see how well it fits with the previous one. By the way, don't forget to save different stages of your work from time to time. To quickly save a scene with a new counting number, press Alt Shift S. And of course, Cascadeur has an auto save feature. So now we've set the keyframes where the character makes contact with the ground. Keyframes contain the most important poses in the entire motion. In a way, key poses define the motion. For example, in the jump part, the highest point of the jump will be the most important one. This is the part where the character performs a kick. But the pose where the leg starts to swing is equally important. That pose will help to make the motion more precise, as the character does not begin to raise the leg to make the kick right from the ground. At first, the leg is bent at the knee. And if we are to reflect that in the animation, we'll need another keyframe. First, we can unfix the points. 
Legs are raised and bent at the knees. Don't forget that the angles at the knees and elbows should not be straight. Here we have to activate the points of the head, as the head and the neck are both tilted. On the reference, we can see the elbow. This means that the arm is bent. The back is also slightly bent. Then we select every point and move the character up. Now the frame with a kick. The leg is now straightened. Also, the character's entire body leans slightly forward. And finally, the landing frame. This leg has touched the ground already, while the other one is still in the air. The foot will automatically go up on its toe when it makes contact with the ground. The character also begins to turn. I always try to deactivate the controllers that are not really used in a given pose. Thus, our next keyframe should be at the place where both legs are touching the ground. I fix the toe points so they don't move when I move the main foot point. We don't have to put too much effort into each pose at the current stage. Using auto-posing and auto-physics tools in Cascader requires a certain approach. Currently, we're using auto-posing to create a kind of a rough sketch, so I don't really care about making my poses flawless. At this stage, it's more important to make them similar to the ones in the reference, not to go too much into detail, because in the future we might need to make adjustments to them. The current stage prioritizes speed and flexibility. Its purpose is to put the very idea of your animation to the test. And once you are certain the animation actually works, you can then get to refining the poses. And the final frame. The character gets to the lost pose after the jump. In this pose, both feet make full contact with the ground. Otherwise, this pose is not very different from the previous one. So now we have all the main poses. Creating them is the part of the animation workflow known as blocking. Let's try and play the animation. For now, however, it's just keyframes with nothing in between. Let's add interpolation. Hold the left mouse button and select every frame on the timeline. Now select the Bezier clamped interpolation. You can quickly limit the working area to only the last frame by using this button. So let's play the animation again. It's already obvious that the character's arms don't quite move like we want them to. The point at the character's hands moves in a straight line towards the next frame. This happens because the default type of interpolation is IK. The arms points lie on a separate track, which means we can set a different type of interpolation for them. In our case, it's better to use FK. This way, the arms will move as a whole from the shoulders. There's also a global rotation type of interpolation, which is similar to the FK. When using FK, the trajectory of a body part can be influenced by the parts that are higher in the hierarchy. For example, if I move the shoulder, this would change the hand's trajectory. Currently, these changes are minimal, but they can become rather significant. This doesn't happen when using global rotation. At this point, though, global rotation doesn't work all that well due to a small number of keyframes. Because of that, it makes more sense to use it at the later stages of the workflow. In our case, we want to set the arms to FK for the entire length of the animation.
let's fold the tracks back. So the way the arms move now is a bit more lifelike. But in some intervals, there's still not enough information to achieve the desired motion. Check this interval, for instance. In our animation, the character's arm is in the halfway to its next position. Meanwhile, on the reference, the character is still setting up the pose, tilting backwards to make the following swing sharper. Now we'll need more keys to make these details show in the animation. Let's add a new key. Cascader has a tween machine. This tool allows you to quickly match the object positions to those in the previous or following frames. Open the tween machine panel. Select the points at the arms and move the slider to the left. This way you'll move the arms position closer to the previous key. Here it would be enough to only move the arm, but sometimes this tool can save you a lot of work. I'm gonna make some manual adjustments to the position of the arm. The character's body slightly rotates in the opposite direction. The position of the leg doesn't change in this interval, so we can simply copy its points from frame 0. We can further improve the character's pose on this frame. The leg here is straightened almost completely, but the foot is still in full contact with the ground. As the character uses this leg to propel himself, the leg acts as a fulcrum. Here we also have the arm moving in a rather notable way. Sometimes it might be difficult to grasp the characteristics of a motion when you only see it from one angle. For a case like this, you can try different approaches, or attempt to replicate this motion by yourself. For now though, we shouldn't be getting too much into it. Keep in mind that at this stage our goal is to make a quick sketch of the animation. Here we can add a new key to update the position of the lag. We can also add another key after the landing, because the character squats a bit right after. Normally Autophysics is able to add details like squatting after a jump automatically, but it won't hurt to add a key just in case. Let me show you another simple trick. Let's take a look at the leg's trajectory during the kick. The farther the points from each other are on the trajectory, the higher the speed is on this interval. And here we can see that right before the kick, the distance between the points decreases, which means the leg slows down before the kick. On this interval, it only covers this short distance. The slowdown happens due to the properties of interpolation, but it doesn't make the kick look very impressive. In reality, the leg should actually gain maximum speed right before the kick. To adjust the speed, we can create a new key next to the one with the kick. Now we need to move the leg in a way that will make the distances between the points longer. Alright, now the leg accelerates before the kick. But there's also an interval after the kick where the leg stops a bit too abruptly and moves backward. It would be better to add a little overlap in there. We shall use a different type of interpolation for this. Select the frames with the character in midair and choose the Bezier interpolation. This type of interpolation might produce questionable results for the legs resting on the ground, such as causing them to slide, but for kicks and other similar moves, it works really well. And so we end up with the animation draft, which is pretty close to the reference. It is time to enable autophysics. 
The physics ghost shows how the animation would look with certain physics tools and settings applied. The color of the stripe above the timeline represents the intervals with or without fulcra. The orange interval indicates a jump. The character doesn't have any fulcrum points there. The yellow one has a single fulcrum. And the green intervals represent frames with big fulcrum area. If the color of the interval doesn't match the intended idea, there are ways to fix that. For example, this interval is green, meaning both legs act as fulcra, while in reality, this foot doesn't touch the ground. Select all points of the foot, go to Fulcrum tab, click Not Fulcrum button. The green area under the foot has disappeared and the interval color is now yellow. What does Autophysics do with animations like this by default? I'll use a very schematic animation as an example. The character here makes a jump, but the pose doesn't change and the interpolation type is set to linear. The center of mass trajectory suggested by Autophysics is shown as a red line. By the way, you can choose which elements you'd like to see rendered by right-clicking the View Mode button. Look at the trajectory of the center of mass. Now the character squats before making a jump. The jumping trajectory and velocity have also been adjusted. And having landed, the character squats again, moving a bit like a spring, making the animation feel more lifelike without adding any new keyframes. And this is how Autophysics can improve the animation. If I add new keyframes, Autophysics will take them into account as well. For example, I could add a key to position the character a bit lower. And the physics ghost will reflect these changes by making the characters co-op more. There might be times when you'll need to use additional autophysics parameters to achieve an artistic result. For example, these quads before and after the jump are controlled by the vertical force smoothness parameter. If you set it to zero, the character won't squat at all when setting up the jump. With this particular animation, it would look strange, but for some complex movements, a setting like this might come in handy. As a rule, when the animation follows the reference close enough, it should turn out rather accurate in terms of physics. To make the difference between the ghost and the original animation easier to notice, you can click this button. It makes the ghost coordinates match the character. The biggest differences may occur in the part of the animation where the character performs a jump. In our case, the physics ghost shows that an average human being could not possibly jump this high with the Earth gravity. But what if my character is no ordinary person, but a superhero? Maybe it's my intention for him to jump higher than a normal person ever would, but also obey the laws of physics. There are several ways to achieve that. For instance, I could extend the duration of the jump. Currently, the character doesn't have enough time to reach the height I need. But if I add more frames, it might solve the problem. On the timeline, select the interval containing the frames of the jump. Press Ctrl T. A yellow border will appear around the frames. Drag the last frame to stretch the interval. So now there should be enough time for the character to jump higher. However, increasing the number of frames and thus extending the time may sometimes become an issue. Say, in games, it's often critical for the movements to be rather swift. For this purpose, you may want to adjust the gravity instead. First, I will undo the changes by pressing Ctrl Z. Now I will try to solve the problem using gravity. The higher the value is, the less time it'll take the character to reach the same height, meaning that jump will turn out higher within the same number of frames. Here I want to make the animation realistic, so I'll leave the Earth's gravity value. I also won't increase the height of the jump too much. Instead, I will only add a couple of frames. It's okay that the character would jump a bit lower. Also, physics can also correct the character's rotation in midair. Check out the reference. Pay attention to the way the actor rotates. At the beginning of the motion, he faces the camera, but when he lands on the other side, he now faces the opposite direction. He did not do that on purpose, nor attempted to make the whole stunt look better. This is a completely natural consequence of the laws of physics. The thing is, rotation in midair is consistent and doesn't change without external influence. For example, if you toss an object up in the air, this object won't just start rotating all of a sudden, unless of course it hits something. 
an object always retains its angular momentum while airborne. This works exactly the same for complex living creatures. It might be more difficult to tell though, because creatures can change their poses in midair. Changing the pose can lead to changes in the rotation speed. Ballet dancers, for example, hold their arms closer to their bodies to rotate faster. But the angular momentum always remains the same. Well, let's actually go back to our kick animation. Let's see how it would look if the character didn't turn, just jumped up and landed in the position identical to a starting one. After all, sometimes we might need to make this kind of animation as well. So we enable auto physics and see that it rotates the character a bit during the jump, and the leg kicks a bit sideways. In our animation, the difference is very subtle, but in some other cases, it might be much more pronounced. In this animation, the leg rotates upward, but in the end, the resulting rotation evens out, so the leg hits lower than it should. In Cascadeur, we can monitor rotation with great precision using the angular momentum tool. Look at this arrow. When the character is airborne, its length and direction should not change. Currently, the arrow direction changes on these frames, meaning angular momentum changes as well, which shouldn't be possible according to the laws of physics. This is why Autophysics rotates the character in midair, making the angular momentum consistent, and the arrow is now equalized. On the physical ghost, we can see the end result. I want the leg to keep its position for my original animation during the kick, so I'm selecting these frames. Now select the points of the leg, open the physics corrector tab and set the value in this field to 100. This practically means that I want the auto physics to strictly follow my original animation. By the way, make sure that this button is turned on. This way, the values you set will be applied to every selected frame. Now the leg retains its position, but look how the character's torso has moved. This way, the character compensates for the leg rotation. And such compensation can be seen in many different motions, both in mid-air and on the ground. If you follow the reference as closely as possible, Autophysics is most likely to only make some minor adjustments to it. This was the case with our animation. With this animation, we don't need to change rotation too much. But I'll still set the leg performing the kick to keep its position on this interval. But first, I'll fix a few things. After retiming has been applied, the kick pose moves one frame forward, so kicking frame no longer has a key. It will be better to once again set it as a keyframe, because it's convenient to have main poses on keyframes. Now we can either move the previous key or set the Bezier interpolation for it. So select the leg points, select the frames with the kick, turn on the interval edit mode, now set the value to 100 so the kicking leg would fully retain its position on these frames. So if the length and the height of the jump match your intention, you can simply click the snap button. Then the character will move just like the ghost did. Pay attention to the timeline. The pink colour means that different tracks have different types of interpolation set to them. As you can see, on every track that contains the character, the type of interpolation has been set to fixed. Interpolation is automatically set to fixed when we snap the character to auto physics with this option enabled. Fixed interpolation won't change as we change keyframes. For now, however, we don't need this. Let's undo the lost action by pressing Ctrl Z. Then I'll turn off the Fix Interpolation button. And once again, apply Auto Physics to the character. Let's also set the interpolation on the jumping interval back to Bezier. At this point, we can turn off the reference as we have no intention to recreate it fully. Besides, timings in our animation are already different from those in the reference. Auto Physics can also make the animation feel more lifelike by adding secondary motion. Let me show you how this works in this simple example. Say we have this simple animation with a dinosaur in it. The dinosaur simply moves upward, then descends and just stands still for some time. Secondary motion applies various swings and legs for various parts of the character. This mode can work separately from the main Auto Physics mode. 
Let's disable the physics corrector and enable secondary motion. Because the regular correction is turned off, the stripe above the timeline no longer shows the number of fulcrum points. Currently, there are no changes on the physics ghost because we haven't yet defined points to which secondary motion should be applied. I select the points at the tail and open the secondary motion panel. There we can see four parameters. All these parameters can be animated, meaning they can have different values on different frames. If we want to change the value for each frame at once, we'll need to turn on this button. It should be highlighted red. So the first two parameters define how much of the original animation in either global or local space should be taken into account by secondary motion. The lower the values in these fields are, the greater the changes will be. The damping setting controls the number of oscillations. The air friction setting defines how much various body parts should decelerate under the influence of the environment. Think about this as making the air more dense. There cannot be any set instruction on how exactly you should add secondary motion to your animation. It always depends on the kind of animation you're going for and on your own artistic intention. Here, for example, I think it would be best to add secondary motion to the interval with the kick and the one right after. In this way, I'd like the character's body to react to the kick and to the landing. You can enable secondary motion on the physics settings panel. I'll start with the shoulders. The shoulders set the general movement for the arms. If you like to change the value for every frame on the interval, make sure that this button is enabled. I'll try to set global blending to 50. In this case, local blending can be turned off. So it's clear that the current values are too high. For now though, I'd like to see if the motions themselves look appealing. And this is easier to see with higher values. Now the arms. I will set the local blending value to 10. At this value, you can clearly see the changes. Now the arms display major overlappings. On this interval, however, I don't need them to overlap like this. I only need the character to move the arms down. So I'll increase the global blending value. After I do this, overlappings remain only on the interval right after the kick, and also the one that follows the landing. Now I'll need to reduce the effect of the changes. To do this, I could try increasing the damping, air friction or local blending values. For your animation, different values might be a better fit. Simply enter various numbers and see which ones produce better results. Now I can also set up secondary motion for the torso and the head. At first, I'll use very low blending values to better see the characteristics of the changes. After that, I'll be decreasing their strength. On this interval, I really don't need the head to shake. Here, I'll set a higher value. Then I'll be changing values in this window and see how they affect the results. I'll be trying different values and see which ones work best. I think I like how the motions play out. Now I can apply the secondary motion to my character. When you try to apply secondary motion, you'll get this warning. The best way to apply this effect is to only do it once. Otherwise, you might get a situation where a new secondary animation would be applied to a previous one, bit by bit amplifying the effect. In my case, I have no intention of making any major adjustments to the physics, so I can freely apply the secondary motion. I'll also reset the settings to their default state. This will help me avoid applying secondary motion twice, even if it would remain enabled. Sometimes, even the smallest of secondary motion effects can alter the physical behavior of the whole character. So after you snap the character to the secondary motion, I'd recommend enabling the basic physics correction mode and snap the character again. Now the main part of the animation is complete. 
but let's polish it a bit, shall we? Polishing animation is best performed in the point controller mode. This way you'll be able to adjust a particular point without affecting its neighbors. First of all, let's add more keyframes for the feet. Then we can animate the feet with greater precision and define not only the fulcrum frames, but also frames where a foot either fully steps on the ground or simply changes its position a bit. At this stage, it is better to set the global rotation interpolation type for the arms. After this, we can check the trajectories for the body parts. To do so, select the frames on the timeline and click the points to see their trajectories. Make sure that the trajectories are smooth and form curve-like shapes. Go to different keyframes and correct the positions of body parts in them. Notice how various body parts behave on the reference. Pay attention to both the shape of the line and to the distances between the points. Your goal is to improve the intervals where body parts suddenly slow down or accelerate too much. This stage is different for everyone. Because of this, I won't be showing the entire process of polishing. It can be rather long and tedious. But still, this is something that truly makes the animation complete. The better your initial keyframes are, the less effort you'll have to put into cleaning up your animation. Check how your animation looks from different angles. It's best when trajectories look good from every angle. Make sure the poses in all frames are good. For example, this frame, the arm goes through the body. On certain intervals, you can even put fixed type of interpolation to use and adjust every frame manually. You can play the animation in slow motion to make the smaller detail easier to read. So once the animation is all but ready, we can apply auto physics corrections one last time. This time, you can disable this button. And after that, you can export your animation as an FBX or turn it into a video. And that's it. I hope your animation turned out well. Feel free to share it on our Discord channel if you like. The Cascadeur team will also appreciate your comments and answer your questions if you have any. You can contact us through Discord, email or the feedback form, or just leave a comment below. So thank you and I'll see you next time.